back to Watch Us Tonight. I am your host, Tim Masso, and I have to come clean. We pre-recorded this show because something very electronic and very expensive broke prior to the broadcast. I can't live stream. Nevertheless, I am coming to you with my team. This is going to be a blast from the not-too-distant past. Watch Us Tonight starts now. All right, first things first. We're going to be talking about the best and the worst of luxury watch redesigns. Sometimes watch companies nail it. Sometimes they miss badly, and the result can have a major bearing on major products. I'm also going to bring you your wrist shots as we love to show your pieces on these pixels. Jumping straight in, I want to emphasize there is no better place than the watchbox.com when it comes time to buy, trade, or sell a watch, especially when you want to sell your watch. We pay cash, we pay fast, we make it fun. 24 hours a day and global, and I will reward you for the privilege of your attention as there is a February giveaway watch. It's the Omega Speedmaster Professional the Moon Watch 145022. That's right, a vintage giveaway watch, but you got to be in it to win it. Guys, you got to come through for me. I want a YouTuber to win it. Link in the description, get in it and win it. Also, you can help me fill the gap, shameless self-promotion. Uh, the Gap, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. I'm looking for 50K in 2K19. So cruising along, viewer wrist shots, here they go. And they start with Josiah N, who shares a winter wonderland as he goes snowmobiling in Minnesota with his Rolex Daytona. A motorsports watch, just not on track. Off track this time, love the shot. John N of West Point, New York, relatively close to my old haunt on Long Island, relaxes with his Nomos Club, and Andrew K shoots his moon watch on the water from South Devon, England. Jordan O easily claims the top full collection shot of the night with his impressive Patek Philippe spread. I'm loving that 5970P, by the way. A collector and a customer of our company, Jordan, thank you for trusting us. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Now, main topic, most and least successful luxury watch redesigns. We're going to qualify this and then work our way through some standouts. But first, let's explain the, the basic premise. Redesigns can make or break a consumer product. We see this all the time in cars, another enthusiast space where aesthetics really matter. A sharp effort can transform perceptions of the staid contours of a C6 Corvette to the piquant junior exotic creases of the red-hot C7 Stingray. Suddenly, people below 60 were buying Corvettes, and I happen to love that particular model as well as its C7R racer equivalent. But the blade of virtue cuts both ways, and remorseless venom awaits those who would exchange the universally loved 1990s BMW E38 7 Series for the doughy and overwrought 2002 E65 7 Series. The 7 Series pursuit of the S-Class took a body blow with that model, and frankly, the Bavarians have been chasing ever since. So why Watch design is among the most charged and delicate topics in this hobby because so much depends on that initial wrist impression. This is a purely emotional and largely aesthetic avocation. Now consider that the first guidance I give when those trying to make a hard decision contact me always is to choose the watch that looks better on your wrist. And this is very sound advice that I've taken myself. And the reason is because if you don't like the way it looks when you wear it, nothing else really matters. The movement, the history, the sales pitch, you won't be happy and you'll have wasted your cash. So for your enjoyment, a survey of the best and the worst luxury watch redesigns. One qualifier. I'm counting only full redesigns of existing models. So detail, for instance, dial variations, like the red hot but incrementally changed Patek Philippe 5270P, and all new hitherto unprecedented model lines, like the dark side of the moon, don't get to play in this particular league. They have to ride the pine. So let's start with success, the 1988 Rolex Daytona. Consider what the Daytona was before 1988, 39 millimeters, kind of ugly, plastic crystal, manual wind, rarely COSC certified, kind of delicate, minimally water resistant, and overstocked in dealer cases, often sitting around for entire calendar years after the manufacturer model year. Now today we only covet those old models, as tough as it is to recall, we only cover those old models because of the energy that the 1988 Rolex Daytona brought to the hitherto moribund model line. Let's remember, it was a transformational watch in so many ways. Automatic winding, blanket COSC chronometer certifications, a solid and contemporary 40 millimeter case, screw down crowns, highly water resistant on every variant. 
metal tachymeter, a sapphire crystal on every model, and an instant wait list. In fact, stories of 1990s steel Rolex Daytona wait lists from the Zenith era, they are the stuff of legend, and these watches are actually at the forefront of emerging Rolex vintage. So that's right, this basic Daytona design has been around for so long that the early models are already considered desirable vintage. Almost nothing about the external Daytona, if you really think about it, has changed since 1988. Oh sure, it's received a better bracelet, more solid clasp, a uh, new in-house caliber that you can't see and functionally have difficult dis difficulty discerning, and the detail revisions to the dial are the kind of thing you observe at six inches range with a loop, but Rolex knows not to mess with success. Fundamentally, the 88 Daytona and the 2019 Daytona have almost everything in common. 31 years before 1988, consider what a sea change this was, what a watershed. 31 years before 88, there was no Rolex Daytona. 31 years after 1988, the watch looks almost identical. Let's face it, it's almost the same thing. Add a new movement, a better bracelet, and a ceramic bezel, and you're there. Rolex aced it in 88. Now, failure. 30 years after that seminal Daytona, the 2018 Breguet Marine, and this is where we're going to strike a little bit of a nerve because I know a lot of folks are very partial to the original Breguet Marine models. Background. Following its acquisition by the Swatch Group in 1999, Breguet had two signature model lines. One was the Type 20 Pilot Swatch family, and the other was the Marine water-resistant swimmable sports watch. The arrival of the Marine 5817 in 2004 helped to strengthen Breguet overall and gave it a legitimate luxury sports watch alternative to models from Vacheron, AP, and Patek Philippe at the time. Given the importance of Breguet to Swatch, and the Marine to Breguet, the 2018 redesign of the line should have been a high watermark for the Hayek family's flagship brand. Not the case, or the lugs, or the dial. The tangible shock throughout the watch community, the extent that the watch community can be shocked, when the first press images arrived on the eve of Baselworld, how to describe it? Sterile, cold, anodyne, anonymous, unrecognizable as Marine, that was, that was really the universal cry on the forums. Because the timepiece doesn't look like a Marine, it doesn't look like a Breguet, all manner of comments from all sources left no doubt. This was a miss. The watches, in their defense, are well made, properly finished, and expensively engineered. But just like we discussed in the open, if it doesn't look right on the wrist, then it isn't right. There's no after the fact justification to make you change your mind. When the arm's length impression doesn't thrill, you stop right there. Bereft of identity and character, the 2018 Marine line has become a bit of a jarring case study in luxury redesigns gone wrong. Okay, let's talk about success, and arguably the success of modern era Omega luxury, the 1993 Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter. Once again, a little bit of context and history helps put this watch in perspective. In 1957, the first Omega Seamaster 300, the CK2913, the first diveable Seamaster, bowed, and it looked like this. In 1968, 11 years later, a dive-oriented Seamaster 300 looked like this. And here's one from 1988. As you can see, there is a good deal of aesthetic drift. Nothing about that first watch seems to have been carried over to the third, with the general exception of a rotating dive watch bezel. Finally, here's the 1993 watch change. But it continues. 25 years later, the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter, as launched at Basel World 2018, looks like this. Now can you tell me which of those first Seamaster divers was the game changer? That's right, it was the fourth watch, because a quarter century later, it's still with us. We're on the same page, and 1993 was the inflection point, not just for the Seamaster line, but for Omega as a whole, as it struggled to recover from the quartz crisis. Remember, the Moon Watch was in the catalog continuously. It was the change in the Seamaster family and the Seamaster's fortunes that really turned Omega around in the 90s. I would even say you could forget George Clooney, Michael Schumacher, Nicole Kidman, even Pierce Brosnan and James Bond, because the revolution was already underway from 1993, two full years before Bond wowed with the Seamaster 300 in Goldeneye. And I would have to say that more than any other watch, it was the force that revived Omega as we know it today. Failure. 
Okay, this one gets emotional because I'm partial to the watch, but I have to be honest, the 2011 Rolex Explorer 242. This one's hard to fault because I personally adore the model, especially with its polar white dial, and it would be one of the first two or three Rolex watches that I'd buy with my own money. That said, I'm an army of one, and that's only my personal opinion. I know that others in our audience are fans of this model, so I'm not slagging it down. I'm just describing history as it has unfolded. Because history will remember the current 42mm Explorer 2 as, at best, a glancing blow and a loss by decision for a company that's used to landing square uppercuts for knockout wins. And too large by about 2mm, the larger Explorer 2 immediately suffered by collector comparison to the well-loved previous 40mm Explorer 2, as well as the then-current and still-current today 40mm GMT Master 2. Two years after 2011, remember 2013, Rolex launched the GMT BLNR, and the 42mm Explorer as a dual-time option was relegated to permanent coach class, while the GMT Master 2 flew on a Gulfstream. 6, Solo, Charter. It's that kind of difference. The current Rolex Explorer, and this is the tale of the tape, measure what the market has to say, but the current Rolex Explorer 242 retails for $8,200 and it sells pre-owned between $7,000 and $7,500, whereas the GMT Master 2, especially the black and blue, retails for well, forget it. In every single steel variant, it sells for over retail, so it's whatever the market dictates. The bottom line is you can spend under $9,000 on a GMT and see that same watch sell hours later on Chrono 24 for five figures. The Explorer 2, not the case. The fact that it actually loses its value is the verdict of the marketplace. And at best, the Explorer 242 will be a bit of a cult watch for folks like me and for a lot of you. It'll never be a star, but I suspect that Due to the response to the 42mm supercase, the 42 will be a one-generation model, and the next Explorer 2, just like the retrenchment of the Date 8 2 to Date 8 40, I think the next Explorer 2 is going to be a 41 or a 40mm, and you can write that down. I'm willing to write that down in blood. Okay, failure. From a high horology brand that has done precious little wrong since 1999, this is 20 years of F.P. Journe as a manufacturer, and frankly, the F.P. Journe Tourbillon Vertical was a 20th anniversary swing and a miss. Here's the thing, again, we, we arrive at a watch that I would love to own. Objectively, it is very cool. It has immense artistic and technical merits. F.P. Journe, moreover, was correct to reason that a vertical tourbillon can lay in any position on your dresser at night. Either side, crown up, crown down, dial up, dial down, and it will keep exactly the same time, thereby recovering some of the functional logic of a pocket watch tourbillon a la Breguet. But compared to the previous 9.9 millimeter thick tourbillon souverain, the new vertical looks way too thick. And you can see right there in that image, baby got back. Well, sapphire case back, but you get the point. Collectors have been fairly unanimous in their praise of the concept but reservations about the appearance and proportions. And I'm not judging this by my personal aesthetic whims. No, I'm going to be objective, or at the very least, I'm going to measure by another man's yardstick. F.P. Jorn once told me, over dinner, that my 13.7 millimeter thick JLC dual met chronograph was too chunky at 13.7. Now, the new Tourbillon Vertical is 13.6. I like the watch, and objectively, based on what you get, a lot of precious metal, fine finish, and engineering, it is worth the $245,000 retail price for the rose gold. But people in glass casebacks, FP, should not throw stones. Success. 2007 Blancpain 50 Fathoms. Once again, a watch I love, and a watch I can endorse as both a personal favorite and objectively a triumph. And I like to end on high notes, so this is going to conclude as the caboose of our discussion. It's the highest of high highs. In the 2000s, Blancpain was seeking to reboot its eternal icon, the then 40mm 50 Fathoms dive watch. Blancpain was smart, too. It looked around and saw the lay of the land. Rolex was going to dominate the mid-market steel sports watch segment with the Submariner and the Sea Dweller, whereas AP would dominate the high end of the sports watch market with an avant-garde design that was the diametrical opposite of what Rolex was doing with its heritage-inspired divers. So Blancpain intelligently decided to take some of the heritage elements of its 50 Fathoms and combine it with no-holds-barred, cost-no-object luxury refinement. 
To wit, the solution was to borrow essential details from the 1953 50 Fathoms, that original reference that did battle with the 53 Rolex Submariner, and then add a level of luxury, just not imagery, to rival the AP Offshore. The result would be a watch without any true equivalent in the market circa 2007, a traditionally styled but ultra luxury steel dive watch. Blancpain loaded its new champion with all of the goods, a hand finished bright polished steel case, five day automatic winding, Frédéric Piguet high horology hand finished caliber, and lush cambered sapphire bezel borrowed from the 40 millimeter 2003 50 Fathoms anniversary model, the 50th anniversary 50 Fathoms. The bezel was a keeper. The latter enabled both a fully loomed bezel and scratch resistance to match the crystal over the dial. 12 years later, the reference 5015 50 Fathoms still feels fresh and impressive as variants like last year's exquisite blue titanium model prove the enduring appeal and essential rightness of that 2007 redesign. Honorable mention, the 2004 Vacheron Constantin Overseas. The second generation Overseas finally vaulted the previously undersized and frankly somewhat petite and shall we say gender neutral overseas line firmly into the ranks of the masculine steel sports watch that was now an AP and Patek Philippe alternative. And dishonorable mention, the 2017 IVC Da Vinci line, which was wonderful from a nostalgic and romantic standpoint, as the little known hinge lug Da Vinci got an entire new model year devoted to it at SIHH, but it fell on deaf ears, as only the folks who watched this program and some of the old timers in Schaffhausen had a deep seated love for that hinge lug Da Vinci. Now, viewer wrist shots, we conclude with some of your pieces on these pixels. Martin N. sports a leading 2018 new model year debut from the 50 Fathoms line with his Blancpain Bathyscaf 50 Fathoms Day Date 70s, a wonderful fumé dial throwback to the era of earth tones and panel vans. Marco M. of Richmond, Virginia, by way of Brazil, rides the rails with his IWC pilot time zoner en route to Zurich through Switzerland. Olsen takes the plunge with his Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean at Stingray City in the Grand Caymans, and Andreas W. of Sweden takes us home with my favorite and the rarest variant of the Zenith Defi El Primero 21, the rarely seen solid dial model. Guys, thank you so much. Send me your wrist shots. I'll put them up. I don't care if it's a Seiko 5. I don't care if you bought it from a competitor. I don't care if it's a replica watch. If you're happy, I'm happy. Send me your wrist shots at mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. And if you will, win this watch and take a wrist shot. I'm giving away an Omega Moon watch, a vintage 145.022. Be in it to win it. Click the link in the description. If a YouTuber doesn't win this thing, I'm seriously going to lose it. So make me proud, boys. Join me after. Tell me in the comments below what your favorite and favorite failures in the redesign segment have been, who's won, who's lost, what models and when, and join me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram, where the watch reviews and watch video continue after the lights go down. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew, this has been a blast from the past, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.